I haven't figured out how to do the, you know, music in the background. <laughs> I could I'm a really bad singer, so <laughs> I'm not gonna entertain you all. I offered to sing. <laughs> All right. Well, and for those of you who are on the webinar already, feel free to, you know, enter into the chat box where you're from, what the weather's like, if you're done shopping for Christmas. Oh, we've got Mississippi, Michigan, Jacksonville, Florida. It's freezing in Jacksonville, apparently, in the low 50s. Oh, I see Heidi. I think it's 30 here. <laughs> Cold and rainy. Yep, pretty typical. Atlanta, San Antonio, Arizona. Oh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. I, I'll, I would like to go there. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Well, it is three o'clock on the dot here in Denver, Colorado. We are gonna go ahead and start today's webinar. So thank you again so much for joining us. I'm Gretchen Shaw, I'm the Deputy Director here at NCADD. And um, today's webinar is Black Women and Domestic Violence, Continuing the Conversation. Today's panelists are Veta Sanders, Joy Ingram, and Sirena Martin was, um, I think, intends to join us today. We haven't heard from her, so we're not sure if she's going to be showing up or not. Regardless, we're going to move forward with this incredible conversation, uh, which will be moderated today by NCADV's president, Ruth Glenn. We also want to give a special shout out to Tom's and say thank you for sponsoring this webinar. They have certainly made it possible for us to offer the webinar for free, so we are quite thrilled about that. Um, Gordon, if you could move forward with the next slide. So also for those of you who might um, utilize ASL translation, translation services, we do have interpreters available for today's webinar. So be sure to pin their videos to your screen if that's something you wish to utilize. Also, I'm, I, we have um, set this so that it provides live captioning. I'm hoping everyone can see that. What I see doesn't necessarily mean others can see. So I'm sure by now, most of you are fam familiar with Zoom, but regardless, we're gonna go ahead and go through a few housekeeping items. Here you can see that you can manage your own audio settings with toolbar at the bottom. You can chat with others via the chat feature. You can raise your hand or, at, or enter a question into the Q&A box. We have found that it actually works most fluidly if people enter their questions in the chat box, but uh, we'll be monitoring both today and we will be leaving time at the end of today's session to address your questions. Today's uh, setup is going to be an open conversation, so Ruth is going to be asking questions um, of all the panelists and they'll be allowed time to answer, but um, you know, be sure to utilize that chat box and we'll be uh, sure to address it at the end. Okay. Gordon, if you wouldn't mind moving forward. So we get a lot of questions from people wanting to know if the session is being recorded, if there's a certificate of attendance, and the answer is yes to those questions. So we will be sending you a copy of the recording, including, um, you know, any relevant PowerPoints. I don't know that I consider this one relevant, but we'll see. And also a link to a downloadable certificate of attendance. Also, upon the close of the webinar, you'll be prompted to take a short survey. If you could please uh, take a minute to fill that out, it's really helpful to us and influences how we move forward with other webinars in the future. Um, next slide. Yes, the ever-present conversation around COVID-19. At the onset of the pandemic, we created a special page on our website, COVID-19 and domestic violence separated by dashes. Here you can find um, a plethora of resources. You can connect with us at NCADV. 
Um, you can get legislative updates and action alerts and find out about other educational events happening um, in relation to domestic violence and COVID-19. And of course, you can catch up on any media coverage around the issue as well. Next slide, slide please. If you um, are a tweeter and like Twitter, please use the hashtag today, hashtag AdvaChat, and follow NCADV on Twitter at, at NCADV. Next slide. All right, so we have a couple of polls. I like taking a minute just to get to know our audience a little bit. So here's the first. How would you define your community type? We've got urban, suburban, rural. Excellent. And it looks like so far we've got about 300 people live with us today. That's a good number. All right. Most folks have um, shared their results. So it looks like most people live in the urban areas followed by suburban and then rural. Great. The next question is quick. Who's participating today? How would you define your role? Do you work? within the domestic violence or sexual assault field? Are you a first responder? Do you work in the medical field, government, legal field, mental health field, student, other? All right. Mm -hmm. Education, fabulous. I see people are sharing as well. All right. So not a surprise to those of us at NCADV that a lot of you are uh, working within this field. You consider yourself survivors, first responders. Uh, we see that we've got people from the legal, medical, and government field, mental health students, and then I'm sure plenty of others. Education, we can't keep up with the answers. Anyway, wonderful. We're thrilled to have you all. All right, next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to let Ruth introduce everyone else, but I'm going to take a minute to introduce us to our uh, wonderful president and CEO, Ruth Glenn. Uh, she, it's certainly a pleasure to introduce her today. She, Ms. Glenn, has worked and volunteered in the domestic violence field for over 25 years and holds a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Colorado Denver Program on Domestic Violence. Ms. Glenn has served on many domestic violence program and funding boards, provided hundreds of presentations on domestic violence, victimization and survival, testified before the Colorado State Legislature and United States Congress, and provided consultation, training, and technical assistance on a local and national level on victim and survivors issues. As a survivor, Ruth also often shares her experience to raise awareness about the dynamics of domestic violence. She, again, is the CEO and president of the National Co Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Previously, she was employed by the Colorado Department of Human Services for 28 years and served as the director of the domestic violence program for the last nine of those years. Technically, she retired in 2013, and then she found us, and we've been lucky enough to have her ever since. <laughs> so I am happy to turn the presentation over to you, Ruth, and I'm going to go on mute and silent. Okay. Thank you so much, Gretchen, and um, it, it has been my pleasure, and feel, I feel extremely lucky that um, I can be here at NCADB. Um, it looks as though we've lost my live video, but um, I will keep going until we figure out why. I can see you, Ruth. I think you're okay. Okay, so I just get to look at my picture. Got it. <laughs> Ruth joined us. So sorry, Ruth, thank you so much. We're thrilled to have you as well. Oh, wonderful. Hi, Serena. So um, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, thank you all so, so much for joining this conversation. Um, I will spend a couple of minutes doing a few things, um, but mostly um, just want to say I am so thrilled that we are able to continue this conversation. Um, I had the pleasure of 
having this conversation with these three ladies um, during our conference in October. And the response was quite overwhelming that um, people wanted us to continue the conversation. Uh, people felt like we, were, we had to end it too soon um, to uh, have the conversation. And they didn't feel as though they were able to ask the questions that they would have liked to have had just a few more minutes to ask. So um, special thanks to all three of you for, for rejoining and partaking again. Um, so with that said, I'll just kind of uh, run through a couple of other housekeeping things and then introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, I would too like to say a special thanks to Tom's Shoes um, for making this webinar um, possible, as well as some other upcoming webinars that we'll have, uh, particularly around social and other issues that pertain to domestic violence and domestic violence victims and survivors. So we're very excited, excited to uh, participate, uh, partner with Tom's on this effort that they wanna be a part of. Um, and as Gretchen said earlier, we had over a thousand people register for the webinar which always makes me a little nervous, but um, I think most importantly, we know how interested people are in this talk, topic and particularly uh, where we are in the world right now with um, all of these issues that impact uh, not only uh, black women, but domestic violence victims and survivors. Um, to say the least, 2020 has brought a host of challenges and topics to the forefront, all of which intersect with and exacerbate the safety landscape for victims and survivors of domestic violence. Black Lives Matters was one of the most predominant conversations that skyrocketed to the top of the list in 2020 and rightfully so, right along with the pandemic. Um, we've all uh, made COVID uh, part of our vernacular, who would have thought? Um, so those two um, were the top topics of, is particularly the early part of 2020. <clears throat> Um, Black Lives Matter is one NC80 values, um, one uh, phrase that NC80 values as a critical um, part of our work as we continue to demand for safety, support, and uh, the rights for domestic violence victims and survivors. We are very well aware, aware that Black women are predominantly harmed by domestic violence. And that doesn't always exclude others. And I've had this, this discussion before that when we talk about black domestic violence victims and survivors that we're excluding others. And I would say, no, we're just making sure that uh, black victims and survivors are included. So um, just to make that very clear. Um, so with all of that said, um, because of the, uh, back to, again, because of the popularity of the session that we conducted at the, the Recognizing Your Power conference in October, um, uh, Serena, Joy, and Veta were so gracious to come back together and continue this conversation. So I'd like to, to preclude that by saying um, some of you may hear similar questions again, but we, we wanted to make sure that we included the most um, important ones and that we didn't lose those in continuing the conversation because sometimes they help set the context even though you may have heard them before. Uh, our intent for this is to better understand and to better support um, Black women who are victims and survivors of domestic violence. Um, we hope that this will help you think um, and really engage not only during this webinar, because this, this is only an hour and a half, right? But really begin to have other conversations about how we best support and provide safety for Black women um, who experience domestic violence. So um, I always feel very badly when we try to, to encapsulate these very important issues and topics into an hour and a half, when we can easily spend a week and a half uh, discovering that. We also encourage you to reach out to your communities and ask them to have those conversations with you um, because this doesn't have to be the end and we certainly will not be able to answer all of the questions that you might have um, that you have that you want to ask or are able to ask or that you come up with later. So um, we really encourage you to reach out to those in, within your communities who may be able to, to provide you some additional thoughts 
um, and answers to your questions. So with that to said, I will, uh, it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce our panelists. And I'm just going to read from the paper because I talk really fast. I know you, you all haven't noticed that. So I wanna make sure I get it right. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Veda Sanders Thomas, who is the <clears throat> E. Desmond Lee Professor of Racial and Ethics, Ethnic Studies at the Brown School at Washington U University in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Sanders Thompson serves as co-director of the Center for Community Health Partnership and Research at the Institute for Public Health at Washington University, is an associate member of the Siteman Cancer Center and a faculty affiliate of the Department of African and African American Studies, as well as the Interdisciplinary Program in Urban Studies. Dr. Thompson is a licensed psychologist and health service provider in the state of Missouri, Dr. Sanders Thompson's research is focused on the health and well being of ethnic and racial minority communities, particularly the African American community. She is also a noted researcher in the areas of racial identity, physio, phys, psychosocial implications of race and ethnicity and health behavior, and social cultural de deter <laughs> determinants of health and mental health disparities. Her goal is to empower members of the community to improve their health and well-being. She teaches courses in human diversity, health disparities, and evidence-based treatments in mental health. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Thompson. Is it Sirena or Sirena? I know I've called you both. It's Serena. Sounds like the tennis player, but spelled a little bit different. Perfect. Thank you. And I, I hope you don't mind me asking, but I, I never want to keep going forward by calling someone by their own name. I appreciate it. Not a problem. <laughs> Serena Martin is founder and CEO of Mahogany Cares, C-A-R-E-S, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a nonprofit organization with a mission to advocate, educate, empower, and bring forth awareness to the many problems that plague women, children, and families in the Milwaukee community. Her focus is on advocating and empowering women who are healing from traumatic experiences. She is a survivor and certified advocate for both domestic violence and sexual assault. She has dedicated her life to being an advocate against domestic violence, vowing to fight for all vict victims honoring her fellow survivors and never forgetting the loved ones we have lost. Her mission is to end generational cycles of domestic violence and abuse in the community by supporting survivors and their families. Serena is willing to speak, motivate, inspire, and advocate for domestic violence matters as she will do today on today's panel. Thank you, Serena. Uh, Joy Ingram is the Education and Community Engagement Facilitator at Love and Joy. She is a love superhero fighting the evil forces of heartache, hatred, and human destruction. Invoking the powers of heart, mind, and pen to create verses of victory and perseverance prose, she helps those in mental and emotional anguish find relief from their suffering and discover new delight in life. She is currently on a mission to spread the beauty of healthy relationships to all those open to receive it. She has worked in domestic violence and sexual assault victim advocacy for four years. Um, again, I'd just like to thank all three of you. I would say give a round of applause, but I, you know, we're a virtual. <laughs> so thank, thanks again to all three of you. Um, and I always feel inspired by the forces of heartache hatred and human destruction. And I think I said that to you before, Joy. Um, it's just such a wonderful way to think about um, all that victims and survivors go through. And you've got a lot of rounds of applause on chat. So um, take a look at that as, as we set the stage. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to take a moment again, just to kind of set the stage um, and um, do some context um, as we think about it and get all of you all that are participating in a same place around what we wanna talk about today. Um, for our panelists and for those of you that heard before, you'll probably, this will probably sound familiar, but I think it's really important um, to provide the context for what we wanna talk about. 
Um, I'd like to jog all of your collective memories in late May and early June, June of 2020 and amidst a deadly global pandemic, beginnings of a deadly global pandem pandemic, people took to the streets all across the country as well as internationally to protest the unchecked state violence against black people. In the article, A Glorious Poetic Rage, New York Times staff writer Jenna Wortham described the moment most eloquently and to a T. In the wake of perverse constellation of deaths at the hands of police and vigilantes, America's current in incarnation of the civil rights movement organized under the rallying cry of Black Lives Matter again and as in the past is more powerful than ever. Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, Nina Pop, Tony McCade, George Floyd, and many, many others. I'd like us all to take a moment to think about that. What brought everyone to those protests? Alicia Garza, the civil rights organizer based in Oakland who coined the phrase Black Lives Matter in a 2013 Facebook post after George Zimmerman was acquitted of killing 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, also said the following of this moment. And now countless lives later, it's finally seen as relevant. So from 2013 to 2020, um, the phrase that was coined is back before us. Um, and most poignantly, poignantly <clears throat> to think about is that seven years later um, and hadn't much changed. Corporations like Ben and Jerry, Sesame Street, and Nickelodeon took to social media to declare Black Lives Matter, whereas our president um, said just the opposite and in fact invoking when the looting starts, shooting starts. Um, accused by Taylor Swift of all people of stoking the fires of racism and white supremacy. What we saw during those first few weeks and continue to see um, as protests will ever re be remembered as what Wortham describes as the biggest collective demonstration against state violence in our lifetime. So now that we are all here and thinking about that and the uh, urgency and recognition of the Black Lives Matter movement, We'd like to shift the conversation about the impact of domestic violence on black women. What does this moment to history mean to you personally and professionally? Again, going back to how I opened the webinar, which is we know that disproportionately black women and other women of color are disproportionately impacted by domestic violence. So when we put in the context, put that in within the context of Black Lives Matter, um, seeing Black people being harmed um, at, within the context of what we're talking about and then understanding how that might impact those women who are being impacted by domestic violence for the most part. Um, I'd like for us to begin our, our uh, question and our panelist um, question and answer. Reminding everyone that there'll be a few minutes left at the end where we can um, take your questions and provide an answer. Um, so I'd like for each of the panelists to just take a minute, three to four minutes to answer those, the following question. Black Lives Matter movement has increased conversations about how the black community is often failed by and further traumatized by law enforcement. How have these conversations influenced conversations around domestic violence and black women? Have you seen changes since the onset of BLM? And if so, what changes? As 2020 comes to an end, we only have a few more days, y'all. How are, how are the conversations about BLM and domestic violence shifting, if at all? Um, I'd like to start with Dr. Thompson and we'll, we'll reverse the order a little bit later. Um. <clears throat> What I will say is that in the context of Black Lives Matter, I think um, there has been much more intentionality about um, all Black 
persons and bodies being considered. I think one of the issues that um, has impacted um, addressing domestic violence in the black community has been the centering of black males. And I think Black Lives Matter has um, lifted up the fact that the impact of violence in the back in the black community, whether it be police relationships or things internal to the community includes black women. The other piece that I think um, has occurred related to Black Lives Matter is um, our understanding of um, gender and sex and moving outside of that binary. And so um, the fact that domestic violence occurs in the context of, of same-sex relationships, as well as um, to the standard um, heterosexual relationship. Um, I think that is clear and we can also now discuss that issue. And then there's also the consideration of those outside of the binary and also trans women. And so I think um, the movement has allowed there to be further discussion of all um, black persons and this issue and struggle to address domestic violence in our community. Um, and I'll stop there and let other people comment. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Uh, Sharina? Serena? Yes, I agree with everything that uh, Dr. Thompson. And then I just wanted to add just the, the conversations to me are very similar one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm very glad that more of the community, more of the nation is listening and really hearing what is going on. The bottom line for women, Black women, or any um, survivor of domestic violence is the safety. When you talk about safety, that's all that they want. They want to be safe. They want to be um, de-escalate de the situation. And the fact that now we, the videos, that this is the truth. These aren't made up situations. People aren't saying, oh, we were scared when the police got there. We didn't know what to do. We didn't want our husband, our father of our child to be victimized further. We just wanted to be safe and we definitely wanted them to be safe whether we're in an unhealthy relationship or not. So I feel like, yes, the Black Lives Matter movement has in one way um, been able to at least get the conversations going as to why um, survivors are not calling the police or that's like the last resort and not wanting to do that. There has to be a reason. And those reasons now have proof with the videos. There's proof. It's a little bit easier maybe to have that conversation with either your advocate or the organization and resources that you are dealing with saying, hey, I'm not sure mm -hmm. that I, I'm not comfortable with getting um, the police involved or any legislation involved. I think that, yes, this is a time where we're able to speak up at, as advocates and say, hey, this is exactly what we've been talking about. We haven't been making these things up. They are true. They're not always recorded, but we've been hearing and listening to our survivors and victims. And they're telling us these things are happening. And it's not always the police. It's a lot of the different um, systems. We have to go into the hospitals and asking for the fair treatment there. I've worked at hospitals and yes, a lot of the doctors and nurses are not those of color. We're, you, they're, you know, so the first face and um, the person providing that care is not looking like that person. So again, we're able to, you know, step in or at least have those conversations with the entire system, with the hospital. I think organizations, hospitals, different companies, you have to have that conversation with your employees and your team members. And now is the time where our voice 
really does matter. Thank you, Serena. Um, I, I think that um, the, the focus on the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, has brought more attention to Black women and domestic violence. And it has brought positive attention to um, Black women and domestic violence. On the flip side of that, there has been some contention between law enforcement and domestic violence agencies because of um, the rise in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there have been instances where law enforcement is now not cooperating with domestic violence agencies because they spoke out in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's problematic, um, especially when you think of areas where there may only be one agency and the police force pulls its support from that agency. So now it's like, what do, you know, what do survivors do? What do victims do when they have issues and they need to call the police, you know, that there's no one that they can call that they really feel safe for because the, the police forces are going public saying that they're not supporting these agencies and that's problematic. So while on the one hand, Black Lives Matter has shined a, a very necessary light on domestic violence at the same time, because it's also shined a light on the corruption in a lot of police departments there there's a lot of backlash due to that absolutely joy so there's a couple of things that i'd like to respond so thank all three of you really quickly but um i i'm i do think that that we have shifted the conversation to include black women who are experiencing domestic violence i really do believe that how long that momentum will last will matter um We've come up with our, you know, we've, we thought we came up with it and then come to find out everybody came up with it, but all Black Lives Matter is um, what we want to, to carry because I go back to also talking about others who experience domestic violence, but the trans women um, who are experiencing domestic violence are uh, predominantly Black women. Um, so we, we have to keep that to the forefront of the conversation. And then, Joy, I couldn't tell you, can't tell you how much I appreciate you bringing the backlash up. Um, I think any movement, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, all Black Lives Matter, um, and particularly when it has to do with women, predominantly women, you are going to see a backlash. So it's, it's almost like this perfect thing where you see the nice storm develop, then you see uh, the backlash, and then you see the waning off. Um, it is our intent at NCADB to keep this at the forefront to the best of our ability. And I can't tell you that how great, how great it is that the three of you are in this effort with us because uh, we can't let this conversation go on. Um, I'm very bothered as are most domestic violence agencies and that's why they stuck out and said Black Lives Matter. Um, because they do care about Black women who are experiencing domestic violence. And how do we help them uh, when they experience that black uh, backlash? So um, any thoughts about what I just said before we, we go to the next question? Betta, you're on mute, dear. <laughs> Not here. Okay, so the thing that did occur to me, you're absolutely right. While we have this elevation of the issue at this point, we do have to be cognizant of the fact that we go through cycles um, where the issues are elevated, um, there is a tension, and the, the critical question is, can we maintain the focus for long enough to make the gains we need to make? Can we gain acceptance of the importance of equity in treatment whether it be by the police, the criminal justice system, the hospital system, um, beyond just a moment in time so that real change occurs. And this is just a matter of practice in every day and not around a specific um, movement or a specific event. Much appreciated about practice, changing culture so that it becomes 
a, a normalcy instead of an event, right? Um, so thank you for that, Dr. Thompson. Um, Dr. Thompson, you have the next question. Um, one thing that came, came out of our discussion during the conference plenary session in October on this topic was the stigma of the strong black woman being the backbone of her family and responsible for keeping the family together. When domestic violence is present, black women are often silenced by the stigma and blamed for the violence perpetrated against them. Can you speak more to this stigma? What other cultural presumptions may be further silencing black women? We already talked about systems who, and the distrust of systems and systems that have not always treated them fairly, but further silencing black women experiencing domestic violence and what may be needed to um, work on those. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting um, that the idea of strength would be stigmatizing and would be a negative for black women, but it often is, that's the reality. Um, and what it comes down to is a perception that if a black woman is strong, somehow she is emasculating. Um, and there's always been concern for black emasculation because of um, the position of black men in society, um, the ability to um, earn a living, to take positions of leadership. But you know, that speaks to a patriarchal notion that is also core That's in right. the larger American society. And that is men are to be in leadership. Men are to be um, the earners. Um, men's work has an external value um, that, should, that, that they should receive pay for women's work or work that women do is not as valuable. Um, hence, we don't receive the same pay and often aren't in positions to make the same decisions about the direction of our lives and that of our family. And so that, um, that stigma around being a strong black woman, being a black woman who wants to enter into the workforce, who expects to receive um, fair pay to be respected um, is often seen as the cause of domestic violence because you are now um, interfering with the ability of the male, the male or the partner in the relationship to be um, strong um, and to take that dominant role and position. And uh, it's interesting because it's not just in the community that stigma is, is embedded in the larger society and system. And, and so when you enter a hospital, when you interact with the police, you, there is that, um, even if it goes unspoken, there are those actions and reactions that say, oh, you caused this because of the way you are and your attitude. And, 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 and even if it's not spoken, that's not lost on the woman who is seeking safety, who is seeking that's care right. in that moment. Now, um, there is tied into that other cultural assumptions. Um, to the extent that we are strong, we are supposed to buffer um, black males against the stress of racism in society without people thinking about the fact that black women experience racism as well. And there need to be people there to buffer them against the racism and the intersection of racism and sexism in society. And so there's that. Um, there is also that the issue, there are also the issues of power and control. And so when you think about power and position in society and how the, that is distributed, Black women are, are not supposed to be in positions of power and control. And so to the extent that domestic violence takes place, um, among women who 
have an education, who have some position, who may have some power in some space, um, they are in some ways blamed. Um, they are in many ways disrespected. Um, and, and, and it's almost used against them. Well, if you're so powerful or you've got so much control, why are you in this situation? Why can't you handle this? Why can't you stop this? Um, so there's always that. And, and very often, you know, we think of only women, particularly black women who are low income as being victims of domestic violence. And that's not true. That's right. I think there is a different type of stigma that emerges for women who are not in that situation. Um, and it plays into the type of protection you can receive from the police, the type of response and care you'll receive um, in the healthcare system. Um, there are notions that, well, you know, black women can handle everything, anything, um, don't experience pain, uh, that one plays into how healthcare will respond. You can take it. Um, we there are so many stereotypes and misconceptions that emerge from both sources. The fact that you're a woman um, and the fact that you're black, and disentangling the two is virtually impossible. Being a black woman is a is is in fact a unique space that brings a lot with it. Um, and while there is a lot that is beautiful and powerful, there is much that is problematic. And I'm going to stop there so um, we can get to other discussions. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Um, it, the interesting part as well um, that I'd like to just kind of take us back to for one second to think about, I don't expect um, a, an answer, but is the conflict of power. Um, so, um, the men in black women's lives don't like to see that black women have power because of the emasculation that you talked about. Now, everything is general. So I want to be very clear about that. Um, we love black men. This is not about them. We love men in general. This is not about them. This is talking about construct and what happens. Um, but I see the conflict of power, um, which is um, they don't like us to be powerful, but then you have others within our sphere of work, school, home, whatever, who see us as powerful and scary. Uh, so when you, when you combine those conflicts, and again, speaking from a, just a kind of a cultural perspective, not, not anyone's exact experience, um, that conflict for Black women, and particularly Black women experiencing domestic violence, can be really problematic. So thank you for, for um, enlightening us on that, and that was a um, um, great thought for me. And thank you for saying that, because I think it can help people if they realize we see this emerge when, when Black women enter politics. We yep. see how they're treated there. Um, when they are on the police force, when they are firefighters, when they enter any role that in some ways we're not supposed to be there right. um, or, to be, or, to, or to be able to manage a particular space in the way that we are. So it's not just here, but you can see how the larger, the constructs and the images and the, and the narrative and the larger society begin to influence the, the way people live their lives and domestic violence is one of those areas. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you very much. Um, uh, Joy. Um, I just love Joy. Uh, <laughs> I love you all, but I love you. <laughs> it was mentioned during the conference session that because the police misconduct, because of police misconducts and the repercussions black abusers may experience because of their interactions with police, black women may fear calling the police to report domestic violence. Um, and you all touched on this. They just want the violence to stop, right? But they may not want their abuser to be arrested or be sent to jail. In your opinion and beyond the obvious, stop killing and imprisoning black people, 
where, how, what can law enforcement do to start building that trust in the Black community? What needs to happen to ensure respect and safety for Black women survivors? And, and that's a huge, huge question that, um, you know, is going to take our nation years to figure out. But if you were given the opportunity, um, what, what would that look like, Joy? Um, I think specifically with regard to domestic violence, I think the police need to be better trained. They need to be better educated. They need to be educated on trauma-informed care. Um, they need to be educated on domestic violence and what it is and what it's not and what a victim looks like. Because going back to the conversation about the stigma of the strong black woman, I think that's problematic when it comes to victimhood and what a victim looks like, because a lot of people don't know and don't understand what domestic violence is and what domestic violence looks like. They don't know what victimhood looks like. You know, when people think, when most people think of domestic violence, they think of the woman with the black eye and the busted lip. You know, they don't think of the emotional abuse. They don't think of the sexual abuse. They don't think of financial abuse. They don't think of, of all the other ways that a woman can be abused besides, you know, being punched in the face. Also with that, when you think of a strong black woman, a lot of people don't think of a victim as someone who fights back, That's you right. know, so when you get a victim who will actually hit her abuser back and fight to save her own life, you know, to most people, she doesn't look like a, a, a victim. She looks like a co-combatant, you right. know, um, and, and she's not viewed as a victim, so she's not helped as a victim. And then when the police come out to the house, you know, she has as she's in as much danger of being arrested or killed as her abuser is by the police. Um, so I think the biggest thing is for police to become more educated, more educated on domestic violence. They need to be trained in diversity and cultural competence. Um, they need to interact more with the Black community, with the community that they police in general, so that they're more comfortable and more familiar with the community and not just coming out to respond to um, crimes of, crim to calls of criminal activity. Wonderful. Um, and you just touched on what my first question was going to be, which is, where do they get that training? I mean, it's one thing um, for the community-based program to provide the training. It's one thing for them to get a grant from federal government to provide that training. But have they gone to their community and said, we want to make sure, or, um, I'm talking about the police, of course, law enforcement. We want to make sure that we do the best that we can do for the community that we serve. What would you suggest that that we concentrate on and how would we go about getting that? Now, I also wanna be very clear, um, this is not law enforcement bashing, so to speak. This is really about how can we come together as a community within those individual communities and as a nation to make sure that, as Joy so eloquently put it, that when a police officer is responding to a domestic violence situation, that not only are we not listening to the survivor, but the survivor may end up being the one that's killed. Um, and, and because of all of these constructs that we're talking about that need to happen. So um, thank you so much for that, Joy. Um, I, I really encourage, and, and I don't have the answer, I wish I did, um, like all of us do, um, but how do we make sure that that is not just a system training that's training a system, that it's, it's a community that's educating and training that system as well. Okay. I think that the focus is gonna have to be more community-based. Um, I think right now, a lot, of, a lot of communities are disjointed where you have the police as a separate entity and, and not so much as a part of the community at large. Um, I think when you talk about constructs, system constructs, there's a certain um, power play that's there and for the police to actually integrate with the rest of the community that's going to take a bit of the power away and from folks who've been in power you know for a really long time that they're not just going to concede power 
you know, just just easily like that because it, it, there's there's comfort in the power that they have and they don't want to give up that comfort. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, <laughs> which is interesting. Uh, domestic violence is about power and control. So how do you how do you maintain control um, over yourself and a community if you don't um, maintain that control? <laughs> so anyway, um, we could go on and on, but we will not. We only have so much time. Uh, Serena, um, I love you too. Um, in, wor in working with Black women um, who are victims of domestic violence, what are they identifying as their most pressing issues? Are they finding solutions to meet those needs and issues? Absolutely. It really goes back to the two questions we just went out, talked about. One of the biggest is, I think, well, we're here in Wisconsin. It is, it's getting there. It's cold. It's below 30 degrees now. Oh so my goodness. Absolutely. Ooh. We have, yeah, we have major concerns. I had a associate right. come by today. She's doing a, a giveaway. We gave away hats and warm socks and different things. The homelessness, you know, the leaving, the transitional is not um, always wanting to go to a shelter. Um, right. You may own your home or you're comfortable there. That's your neighborhood. Your kids go to school there. You go grocery shopping there. That's my home. You don't want to feel as though you're being punished. Now I have to redo everything. I have to find a new place to live. I have to come up with the down payment, or I have a mortgage. What are you know? What are your real options? You know, you may or may not want to go to a shelter. That's not you're working. They have rules and different things. We're not bashing shelters whatsoever. But I've had so many uh, women and survivors say, I just, that's not what I want to do. I don't, I want to stay with my children. We've had situations where uh, in a shelter, you can't take a child over 10 or 12, a male child, you know, different things like that, where that shelter just isn't an option. So what do I do? How do I transition? I really want to leave the right. unhealthy relationship where am I going to go? Staying with friends and family. We know how that could be. It's oh, yeah. It's definitely a blessing. Right. But then you're, you're, again, you're under somebody else's control. They say when you can come and go, they have all the rules. So I think, you know, definitely transition and shelter, that whole big piece. We have, our shelters are filled to the max here. Oh, my goodness. So I'm calling 10 places and relocating to somewhere 20, 30, 40 miles, that your doctor's here, and I'm in the city of Milwaukee, your doctor's here. The only place I can get you in is 20, 30 miles, 40 minutes from here with no transportation back. Ugh. But I need to get you somewhere tonight. It's cold. I need you to be safe. I don't, you don't want to go back. So those are some of the options and struggles, definitely. Um, one of the other, definitely financial, the power. We just talked about that. I won't go back over that, but you know, you you're having you even having to leave your job. That's a part of it again. This is something that you you're proud of. You're there. You're doing a good job. You're comfortable. Now you have to start over completely. And maybe with nothing, you may have to leave everything there. That's not a good feeling. You've worked hard for your <laughs> furniture. You've worked hard for all of these things. So I think just the finances, what am I going to do in this situation of trauma where I can barely think at all? Now I have to make a decision right now to leave everything I own. Right. And maybe I came to the hospital without my children. They're somewhere else. What you know? It's, I don't have my driver's license. There's so many different things to think about when you're in a state of emergency. I think that now during this whole pandemic, we have had a whole 360 turn of the way we can even provide services. One of the things that I've noticed 
very, um, maybe it's always been, but as of right now during this pandemic, when I'm getting the call or I'm getting a social media hit or I'm getting an inbox, a text, it's not from the survivor. It's actually from the family member, a coworker. People are posting pictures of themselves that with black eyes, and they're just asking for this help in in ways that I that are unbelievable. So then we have, as an advocate, I'm the in between. I'm getting a call from somebody's mother. And then I have to try to contact the person. So there's the more people you have to go through, the harder it is to coordinate and get everything going. So I think that right now with the pandemic, people are in their homes. We're in a stay home ordinance. You may be at home with an abuser. So how are you gonna contact and ask for help? I have so many people their phones are under restriction or mm -hmm. taken. I'm saying, can you meet me at the grocery store? That's the only place we really could go. Uh, we're really having to be strategic. We're really having to be creative. We're really having to pay attention. The, the signals are coming in. We need to be at alert for some of these red flags because it's not the traditional way. I'm not picking up the phone and saying, I'm in a domestic violence relationship, I need help. It's a lot of different signals that we're picking up on. A lot of things are people are posting on social media, just maybe even small hints of what's, oh, you know, I've been locked in the house. You know, you kind of, you, it's time to ask these questions and dig a little right. deeper. Right. Um, right. Offering, we have on our website, um, COVID-19 tips, you know, stay out of rooms where there's um, weapons, just different things that we're trying to get out to the community. Just regular hints, you know, the clothing that you're wearing, having a bag pack. We're really trying to get that information out. It is a little bit more challenging, but we have to step up to the plate. We have to use social media. We have to um, figure this thing out. Um, I've had so much with, like I said, the not the survivor themselves or victim themselves coming. So we just put out on our website different tips, um, what to do if you feel somebody is in danger or going right. through this. Let's start having these conversations ahead of time. Right. We're not seeing our family and friends. So isolation, everybody's isolated. So that's right. not one of the red flags now. So right. we need to be checking in on our loved ones, right. especially those we feel may have been in an unhealthy situation prior to this pandemic. Correct. Last year, you know, our numbers were astronomical. The state right. was going to get over 80 incidents. And I was just gonna touch on that just for one moment. Um, we did have a training here. And in my when I went through my training for advocacy, the police were taking the same exact training I was taking. There were police people, there were pastors, there was medical. So it was a training about advocacy for everyone. And I think it doesn't have to be a separate police training. It doesn't have to be a separate nurse and doctor training. Totally Let's do this together. I'm learning more about what you can do. You're learning more about what I can do. Together, we could really try to um, connect the dots to this, right. uh, to these situations. Right. So thank you so much for that, Serena. So I think what I'm hearing is uh, there may not be that much of a difference of what Black women need, but how do we ensure that we know what they need? Um, yeah. Particularly as, as uh, when they're receiving domestic violence services or support um, from agencies. Um, so yes. thank you so much for that. That's, that's kind of what I picked up out of that. Um, so we're looking for the article to post for you all. Um, but uh, there's a there was a research study done, and this is going to go to Dr. Thompson, 
Um, there was a research study done, African-American attitudes towards domestic violence and DV assistance. Who knew that there was a research study done? I did not. And so when I got it, I was like, holy moly. Um, but it was first published by the National Violence Against Women Prevention Research Center in 2000. What attitudes towards DV services, perceptions of treatment intervention needs, and evaluation of DV programs in the African-American community have changed since the research was published. What has stayed the same? Um, yeah. You're on mute, Dr. Thompson. When you mentioned that, it made me think back because um, when I decided to do that work as a part of the work we were doing at the center, um, there were a lot of raised eyebrows and there were a lot of questions about why I would do that. But I was already doing work um, looking at the services that African Americans received in the mental health system, um, the healthcare system. And so to, for me, every system was open to scrutiny because my experience as a practitioner had been that in point of fact, treatment was not what I would want, not what I would expect and in many instances, not what members of other communities received. Um, and as a psychologist in these systems, um, I often had a front seat to some of um, the transactions and some of the attitudes. And it, it was not and, and is not easy to break down some of the thinking, some of the assumptions made that lead to them. And so one of the things that I have seen change from the time I did that work to now is there are more women of color, there are more black women in the space with um, the ability to speak up, to speak out, to challenge assumptions, to um, advocate for different relationships, attitudes, and to support the voice of black women who are using the services. So that definitely has changed. But what has, and it's interesting because I have been watching the, the chat and one of the comments was that there is ongoing disrespect of women of color um, who are um, in the space running, leading organizations. Um, and, and it's interesting because when I first started doing this work or looking at this issue, that was one of the complaints I received from the advocates that um, I would meet with, talk to, interview, that they, if they were women of color, they often felt um, that their voice, um, they, and particularly if they were leading their own organizations, many felt their organizations were marginalized within the larger community. Um, and so when I saw that in the chat, I thought, okay, that's one thing that clearly has not changed. Right. Um, and it's something that needs to change, but it goes back to the comment I made earlier. And I don't have to belabor this point. As long as um, black people as a whole are marginalized in this society, there is not an organization or an institution that a black person, whether it be a woman or anyone along the, the sexual spectrum is going to lead where they're, they won't encounter some of this. That is the part about being black and about racism. That's the, the portion of systemic raci racism that we have to dismantle. And the one thing that I have come to realize in doing work around race for so long is that a great deal is, is unintentional. And I, and, and I don't mean to say, and I'm not making excuses, when I say unintentional, what is clear to me is that people do not understand how many systems have come into play to create the conditions in which we live today and the structures that have kept people of color, particularly Black people, in certain positions. They just don't recognize these structures and systems. 
Um, we have a lot of work to do to unveil where they are, who they are. And it's not just the police. Um, it's economic, it's your, the banking relationships to keep organizations going, it's the relationship with funders to get what you need to run, it's the philanthropies and who they trust um, with the dollars. It's about systemic racism and I can't um, underplay, I can't elevate that enough. And it's going to take a lot and it's going to take time and commitment. And that's the reason, as I said earlier, it cannot be a moment. Um, that's right. So I, I understand why uh, women of color who are running these organizations um, feel marginalized sometimes, encounter these barriers, because it is just part and parcel of living in the society we live in. And that's one other reason I think the Black Lives Matter movement is important because it elevates and it starts to pull that veil off these systems that we have to intentionally examine and decide where we make changes in order to create space to do the work that will improve lives and outcomes and well-being for all um, Black people. And, and that includes, but it's particularly important for those who are vulnerable. And I think at this point, we have to acknowledge that um, in a, system, a situation of domestic violence, um, women are vulnerable. Now, that doesn't mean they're not strong. It doesn't mean that they aren't capable and they can't move forward and be productive in their lives. But in that moment, they are vulnerable. And in this society, being vulnerable as a person of color is bad for your health. Just yeah. General, and so I'm going to stop there. No, I I, I really appreciate um, uh, addressing uh, the systemic racism part of it um, because you've identified all of the things that Black women survivors and victims, as well as Black women leaders, experience, and um, many of us. Uh, as a black woman, woman, um, I will tell you, I, I go for very long periods of time forgetting that there may be something there that I've, I've just gotten either so accustomed to or I've actually been in culture to or um, the system has been in culture to um, that you don't draw attention to it or you don't think about it, or you just keep going. And particularly uh, for, for uh, Serena and Joy and you, um, being where you wanna be at a place of helping. So you get so driven by making sure that you're helping, um, that you're forgetting that, that you may be experiencing that very systemic racism. And, and why can't I get it? Why can't, well, it's because this thing. Um, and I do also appreciate the, the comment about unintentional um, because it is in culture. It's unintentional because it's in culture. And, and um, when we're talking about systemic racism, of course that's going to impact black women as they're dealing with domestic violence uh, from all different sides of the equation. So um, thank you for, for that, Dr. Thompson. Um, with that said, um, we are um, going to ask another question of all the panelists. Um, we actually hope, hopefully we can get to two of them, but um, I wanna make sure that, that we leave some time for question and answer. Um, so um, if black women experiencing domestic violence are not calling law enforcement to report the abuse or seek help, where are they getting the assistance? Are these alternative resources helping, and if not, what needs to change? Um, so what would that look, what does it look like when they're, when they're not calling law enforcement? Um, Serena? Absolutely. I was just gonna say with all of that, um, there's so many small grassroots organizations, myself, and then I'd have associates and sisters and everybody. They have started these organizations 
again, we go back to what Dr. Thomas just said, the funding, the having to, like I'm a master's program now because I have to have twice the amount of education and accolades and credentials than my co-partners. You know, I, I've applied even for different, you know, director in different positions, but it's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Right. You know, we have a mainstream, um, awesome, awesome program here in our city. However, you know, 85, 90 plus is African-American, yet it's being ran a different, um, you know, it's being ran mainstream. We'll just say that. Right. And, uh, you know, we can volunteer there and do as much as we can, but <laughs> like you're saying, Ruth, we, uh, you got to take care of you too. Um, we really are trying to put forces together and be available. Not everyone again wants to call the police. So we do, you know, we offer every other support and resource that we can. We're helping with employment. We're helping with finding different housing, it, uh, but it's time. Right. You know, somebody needs to leave now. We right. can find a hotel for tonight, but that's not a solution. It's a temporary right. band-aid on a huge right. Right. So, you know, pro just getting together, providing those resources, uh, the grassroots, you know, we work together. We have different um, collaborations where it's mostly through messaging and different things. We have a young lady or a survivor that needs this and this. Whatever somebody has, they're offering it. They're letting it be known. They have a child that needs clothing. We're, pro we're providing those or showing a way where those things can be provided. Or, for, you know, if you have to go to a hotel for tonight, but we need to be thinking and strategizing what that long term is going to look like. Right. Right. Um, right. I think just, yeah, I think. Um, you know, really building that trust in the community, being consistent, which is very, very difficult when we're not in competition with these other organizations. We just want, if they decide to choose our organization, we want to be able to provide just as well as right. another organization. Right, right. Um, uh, Joy or Dr. Thompson, do, do either of you have any thoughts about if they're not calling the police, what what are they doing? Um, well, personally, in addition to um, my organization, Love and Joy, I also work full-time for a domestic violence agency in Stanton, Virginia called New Direction Center. So I know firsthand that if they're not calling the police, even when they are sometimes calling the police, they're calling us. So um, they are calling the domestic violence agencies in their communities. I think um, they're also calling friends and family. Um, I know as an advocate in the community, I've had multiple people come to me and say, hey, you know, my friend is going through this, or, you know, I've got a coworker that's got this kind of situation, or I have a client that's going through this. So they're reaching out to friends and family. They're reaching out to the local domestic violence agencies. And I think that that's a good thing. They're reaching out to other community agencies. I think one of the, the, the one of the problems that I'm seeing is just that enough people don't know about the local resources in their communities. Um, I did like a, a, a simple little Facebook poll one day where I just asked, you know, if you were someone that you know was going through a domestic violence situation, do you know the name of the agency in your community? Um, and here where I live, a lot of people know the agency, but that's because a lot of the people who answered were my Facebook friends and I'm just very vocal <laughs> about the agency. So if they know me, they know New Direction Center. Um, but for people in, in other areas, I found a lot of them just don't know the availability of the resources that are there for them. Um, so I think that a lot of times if they're not calling the police, sometimes they're suffering in silence. I don't have anything to add because I've been looking at the chat and listening to them, and I think they fully answered that. Right, right. Uh, and I and I would um, agree with that, Joy. Um, 
is it usually it's to the point of crisis where you're going to call the police, right? I mean, real crisis. Right. And so you then you make the determination that if I can't trust the person that's hurting me and I can't trust the people that might should be able to respond, um, then I'm just going to deal with this here. So suffering in silence is good. So um, I hear tell that we have many, many questions. Um, Gretchen, is this where I turn it over to you to... Um, Can I just say one thing just very quickly? Oh, oh sure, Serena. I'm sorry about that. That's um, all right. Just in, it's that, um, you know, the first time you call the police and then maybe they come, don't come, and then some survivors are kind of a labeled address now. So that may be a reason they're not calling. I have had those situations where I'm not calling them. It's embarrassing. I called last time. I called last week. Now it's time. To, you know what I mean? Time right. to call again. Right. We have been able to just talk to the police and say, I've had a police officer tell me that if they weren't married or did not have children together, this was not domestic violence. Oh. So... Yeah, just the retraining and getting those opportunities to really talk to the police and making them for yourself. You know, when I was in that situation, it was a time to educate right. a little bit more and you right. know, request that maybe they get take some more training on that, you right. know, right. with the local agencies that we do have. And right. maybe a lot of the times the police do carry brochures of agencies that we have. So right. maybe they're saying, yes, I call the police, but I don't want anybody to go to jail. What can I do? The police having those brochures, phone numbers, stickies, magnets, you know, to provide to um, victims would be another way that they could work right. together instead right. of bumping heads. Right, right. Okay, um, thank you so much, Serena, uh, for following up on that. Um, Gretchen, how does this part work? <laughs> So I am happy to just open up the chat box to. Okay. We have a number of questions that have come in over this session. So I'm going to do those in order of how they started and we'll move through as many questions as we can. Um, so to address supporting black women who work in the anti-violence field, how do we encourage and support black women? Part of the disconnect is because black women are not represented in leadership in many agencies. And oftentimes the dynamic of power between white led agencies and survivors who are black is challenged. So what can we um, as a movement and as people who identify as white, what are some ideas around how we can better empower uh, black women? I would say um, listen yeah. to black women. That's right. um, that that's first and foremost. Listen to them. You know, don't don't feel like you know better than they do because they are because you know you're the advocate or you're the the person that has this title. They're the victim. They're the survivor. They know their situation and their life much better than you do. Um, listen and, and believe and try to help them in the way that they need to be helped and not in the way that you think they need to be helped. Very good. Ruth, I think you were going to say something. I, I just, I, I'm just going to uh, reiterate what Joy said. Also, uh, quite frankly, being a Black woman in a leadership position has presented all of the things that we've talked about, but I think what has been um, and as a survivor, by the way, um, what has been most helpful is having um, people understanding the culture that already doesn't value my voice, um, but being willing to hear that voice. And sometimes saying, okay, I still don't agree. So help me more or, you know, uh, but, but, but that is from my perspective, how, how, allies can make something happen. Whether you're dealing with a victim survivor who's walked through your agency door 
or whether you're dealing with someone who um, is in a leadership position and you still have some of that power um, and that's fine, uh, but how am I, how am I um, allowed uh, to make decisions um, and from a perspective that I understand and you don't, well, that's learning to understand and, and uh, given the space to be heard, uh, giving me or whomever the space to be heard. So I know that was a long piece, but that one touches me in a place. <laughs> the other thing that I will add to what you all have said is that people need to be willing to change a response to hearing those voices. Um, if that's right, make recommendations about programmatic changes, at least consider and, 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 and try to implement some of those. Um, I have had situations where advocates, volunteers, people being served have brought things up, asked for changes, and it's almost like a hard no and a door in the face. Um, that just listening is not enough. You've got to be willing to act too. Right. Absolutely. Abs thank you for that, Dr. Thompson, because you're correct. Excellent. All right. So during COVID-19, we have seen an incident in domestic violence cases, many unreported around the world. How do you think that emergency management or other responding agencies like the fire and police implement this knowledge to best provide resources to Black women that are victims of domestic violence? So how can emergency management, police, um, fire responders, first responders implement? I think at this point, one thing is preparation. They need to know where the resources that are available are, what their capacity is at the time. A lot of it is the same thing we're dealing with in many other areas. Um, COVID changed capacity, COVID changed yeah. you know, how people can work. And so they need to update their systems, update their information um, and use that to respond accordingly. It's having this on the radar as a part of your preparation and planning. Very good, okay. Um, the next question is, how do you see the power and control wheel um, not applying so well to black women compared to white women? Or are you seeing this? <coughs> how is the power and control wheel essentially factoring into assisting um, black women who are victims of domestic violence or is it? From my personal experience as a survivor, um, I feel like the power and control will applies equally um, to black women. Um, I think that when I came to understand that I had actually been a victim of domestic violence, I took a look at the power and control wheel and I realized that out of eight spokes, I think he hit six on the will, and I know the only reason one of them wasn't used was because we didn't have children together. Right. So, you know, that was that was pretty much it. Like it was basically the same all the way around, the isolation, the physical threats, the intimidation, the um, financial abuse, all of it all the way around. So I think that it can, it, it might look different in, in certain ways and in certain instances, and there may be certain things, you know, certain times where, you know, not all of the spokes are hit, but I think that in, in just about any abuse case, there will be some aspects of the power and control will that you will see in any abusive relationship. Totally agree. I agree. And just, uh, you know, as different ethnicities, different races, you know, are, are raised different and it's, what happens here stays here and to keep it a secret and don't tell anybody, nobody should be in your family business. It may look different, but you know, as that trust grows and things grow, that victim or survivor may be able to share more of what's really going on. 
Um, I think a lot of people only ask for help when it's physical and I have a bruise that I can go to the hospital or say, hey, this happened to me. I don't think there a, a lot of um, survivors and victims aren't seeing it as, as um, emergency or as um, horrific if it's not physical. I okay. think maybe some of the training and uh, mm -hmm. just advocacy needs to be better. That, and maybe that could be some of the de-escalation that it doesn't have to get to the next level to physical abuse. Oftentimes it starts with so much of the other, of the power and control wheel, the what you're wearing and all of those things, the verbal, and then it escalates to physical. I think by the time it gets to an advocate or to somebody calling a shelter, it's usually physical. Right, right. It's, but but I, I, I would like for us to think about um, all of us uh, collectively, if we really apply that, and then we're talking about systemic racism um, as one of the barriers to even uh, knowing um, or, or uh, addressing the domestic violence that we might be experiencing, how does that change the power and control will for Black women? Um, so I know we can't answer it right now, but I tell you that I think that's an intriguing question. When you when you talk about that that outside piece, uh, what does that change? So um, let's put on our thinking caps about that. Gretchen, do we have time for one more? Uh, we do. So I'm going to combine. Uh, there's a few questions along the same. So if so. Survivors are not calling police and looking to alternative methods of support um, or alternative methods to addressing violence. What are your thoughts on things like restorative justice and yes. transformative alternatives to um, carceral slash law enforcement slash judicial systems? Oh. What do you all, you know, do you have opinions on how those may work for survivors. I think ultimately the survivor determines what justice looks like for them. Um, so in some cases, the transformative or restorative justice systems may work versus incarceration and getting law enforcement involved for some other people that may not work for them. Um, I think the main point though is, is systemic behavior change um, and, and addressing domestic violence for what it is and having, having survivors be heard and be understood and to help them on their journey to healing um, and to also just to, to educate abusers that what they're doing is abusive um, and it's wrong and it's not, it doesn't have to be their normal way of life, that masculinity doesn't have to be toxic and abusive, that women are not here to be their property and do whatever it is, you know, that they want to do to them. Um, and I think that needs to be a bigger part of, of what, we, what we look at as justice. Yeah. Um, and, and I heard a comment today that, that I would also add to that, Joy, as the closing for um, this webinar, and then Gretchen will have a couple of comments. Um, I would say um, what I heard today also kind of touched me, which is um, we, have, we have always addressed accountabilities for abusers from a carceral perspective. Um, and so outside of what a victim or survivor might choose as restorative justice or alternative transfer, whatever the, all of those terms are, what are, what are we doing um, to ensure um, that we're identifying or trying to figure out what has caused a man to cause harm? Uh, I don't know. And, and I know that it's probably not gonna happen in our lifetime, but um, I really do hope that we get to that um, because it needs to be a twofold approach, right? You can't behave that way, but also help me understand why you do because this is not okay. So um, uh, Gretchen, 
thank you so much. Um, You're very I, welcome. Thank yeah. you all. Yeah, so we've got um, two minutes, maybe just sharing final thoughts. I should address, there are a few questions we weren't able to address on this list, but um, we will figure out how to share the chat. I think that's possible. So um, I just wanna say thank you to all. We will be following up with an email that includes a link to the recording, a certificate of participation. We'll explore trying to um, attach the chat. And um, yeah, you can reach out to us at office at ncadv.org or webinars at ncadv.org if you have questions for us or the panelists that were not addressed during today's webinar. So Ruth, did you have any last comments? Yes, just a just a huge round of applause uh, for uh, Serena, Joy, and Dr. Thompson. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate um, you all participating again, and I'm sure this is not the last you will hear from me or us. Um, so be prepared <laughs> and continue on, ladies. You are strong, wonderful, and beautiful, and awesome. So. Thanks to everyone uh, for joining us and we hope to talk and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays and good night.